the best thing in life is the air we breathe. And it's so open, it is cheap, it is free, it is there for everyone. And that is why we are surviving. God, in all his wisdom, gave us that. Okay? So why are we so myopic and narrow-minded? Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women who have made an impact in Africa. We're talking about their personal, educational and career journeys, the choices they have made along the way and what they have gained by setting aside their doubts in a world where women's voices and opinions often go unheard and unacknowledged. Inspiring Open is a space to explore the value of sisterhood and how networks of sharing and openness can create waves of change. I am Betty Kankambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women, a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. My guest today is Professor Jane Francis Obiageli Agbu. She describes herself as a therapist who uses open philosophy to heal the world around her. Her need to be open with her work is rooted in the love and guidance she received from her mother and other people she describes as significant others. It is this love that she strives to pass on to others by making life better for them in her own small way. Professor Jane Francis has a PhD in clinical psychology from University of Lagos. Her journey towards open education started in 2006 when she joined the National Open University of Nigeria. She rose through the ranks and was promoted to the position of professorship. She is a laureate of the Institute of Open Leadership. She is also on the board of Open Education Global and she joined the Commonwealth of Learning in October 2021 as advisor, higher education. Let's welcome Professor Jane Francis. On this podcast, we like to start from the very beginning to get to know you, you know, as a child growing up, the kind of environment you grew up in, and then you know, the kind of upbringing you had. Yes, um, from Nigeria, um, specifically from a very vibrant uh, town, Onitsha, beautiful town, and uh, I was born December and uh, into a family of 10 children. And uh, I'm actually the eighth child of the 10. We are actually five, five, five boys, five girls, plus my parents. So we made up, uh, we always joke that we can make up football team. <laughs> so I'm the eighth child, the last of the girls. We have five girls and five boys, so I'm the last of the girl. And I have a, yeah, kind of made me especially close to my mom because when the girls left, I stayed, you know, as the last girl, you stay a bit more attached and closer to mom. And uh, it's uh, such a lovely family very loud, very happy, very vibrant, full of love, and a, a very uh, spirit-filled family. You know, we are Catholics. Yes, and um, and I, I, I can say that uh, my mom uh, influenced my me quite a bit because I grew up seeing the strength you know, the love that she has for not just for us, but for people around her. A very simple woman, but full of strength, full of wisdom, full of love. You know, somebody, you know, you have, she has 10 kids and you can't really say who is the best of the children, who she loves the best. You know, I've always wondered how she manages to kind of give us equal love, you know. There's no special child. There is no, I don't know how to put it, but 
it's it's it amazed me up to today. Because anytime I get to village, she's 85 right now. When I travel, the way she welcomes me, you know, she always picture her she, she, with her rapper. Mm. She will dance, give me a hug. Yeah. It's actually the way she welcomes each and every one of us. And you feel so loved and special, you know. Yeah. I, I don't know. I wish I've, <laughs> it amazes me. And, you know, when you come from that kind of love, no matter how challenging things are, you know, you are bound to thrive, you know, you know, so I, so that's the kind of background I grew up in. So family love and background is actually very important because it's, uh, it sets the pace. I had my uh, education in Nigeria, my primary education in Anicha, my town, and my secondary also in my town. And I uh, went forward for my uh, bachelor's degree in psychology at the University of Nigeria, and then my master's at the University of Lagos, as well as my PhD in the University of Lagos. So I'm um, homegrown. <laughs> you know, yeah, it gave me the opportunity to really understand who I am, my culture, where I come from, okay? So, and I, that is what I try to pass on to my, my children. That is actually, I love that really, because I can, it's, I can embrace my culture, my country, and, you know, have deeper understanding of who, where I'm coming from. Yeah, so that is that for my background and my country. I'm proudly Nigeria. I'm Igbo. We have beautiful culture. The culture is so rich. And another thing about Nigerians is we love our food. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> you know, home is always the best. We think traditional. We may be out there, we may be global, but we always think traditional. Yeah. In the way we look, to take ourselves in, in our food, in the way we dress. And also, you know, for us, when we travel, because of the warmth we have, because no Nigerians are very, very happy people. There is, a, there is a, a study I was following on the happiness gene. I don't know whether you, you stumbled on that. And they said that the highest, I think 90 something percent, is actually from Nigeria, from the world map where, the, where Nigeria is situated. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> interesting. That explains it. Because in spite of everything, we always have something to, to laugh about. The kind of things that could have broken uh, other countries don't break us. You know, so uh, there must be, so that I think there's something unique about, I don't know, I'm just thinking because we go through a lot of conflict, challenges in our country, but we're always very optimistic. I just, I love my country. And I also appreciate the fact that I came from a beautiful, beautiful, loving, supportive family. And I always describe my mom as a love personified. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm happy you had that kind of foundation. I equally come from a big family, eight siblings, <laughs> mother and wow. father. So yeah, we, we could also form a football team. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, there's always something to be said about coming from a big family where you can all share. And we we're mostly girls, like there are six girls and the rest are boys. So oh, okay. we will fight, we will bicker, we will do all sorts of things. But when we need to stick together and support each other, oh my goodness, we are right mm -hmm. there supporting each other. Of so course. it's such a good foundation mm -hmm. for, for, for children to have. So yeah, why the choice of psychology it's quite funny anytime I think about that. I think psychology chose me. Yes, psychology chose me, really. When I was um, about to apply for uh, my BSc, you know, let me say, I wasn't really so sure of what I wanted to do. During my era, it was about being a lawyer, 
I knew I, ca- I will not be able to argue well enough. Okay? It's about being a, a medical doctor. I'm very bad in mathematics, science, physics, <laughs> chemistry. <laughs> I said, I knew. I knew that was no good area. Engineering, oh my God, I can do that. So I was thinking, okay, okay, maybe social science, political science. I can, if we thought that political science is about being politician, you know, then it, was, it wasn't that straightforward. Okay, so when I, I was going through, I was going through some, uh, there's this uh, uh, brochure that when you want to go for higher studies, you have to go through them, look at the courses, see the kind of subjects you have and so on. So I stumbled on psychology. First of all, I liked the sound. <laughs> psychology. <laughs> I said, like, oh, okay. Okay, I like the sound. So I started reading about it. What is this all about? It's about human mind. I said, ah, which kind? Well, I mean, this. Ah, let me use my, my language. So I started reading about it. I didn't know. And I had just a few days to make a choice because I needed to submit something for my joint admission matriculation exam. So I said, okay, since I love the sound of psychology, let me just try and see. And also the fact that my courses, my senior secondary examination courses aligned with that. So I just took psychology. <laughs> and surprisingly, I got the admission at University of Nigeria. And the question, the, my admission officer, because then we weren't so much many studying psychology. So we were not that much when we got there. So the first question she asked me was, why psychology? And I, I stupidly told him, I like the sound of psychology. <laughs> but you're a psychologist. Okay. The man looked at me and said, oh, okay. He, he didn't have any response for me. <laughs> so let's say, that, that's why I said, probably psychology chose me. And uh, when I got there, I realized it's filled with statistics, biology. So I was like, okay, I'm in, I'm in. There's no going back. I just have to pull through. (laughs) So the first year, it was tough. I had to kind of adjust because I had no alternative. Some of my friends decided to leave, move to other programs. But I said, let's see, I'm curious. You know, I, I'm curious. Let me try to pull through. And unfortunately, some of the courses we teach in we we are exposed to in psychology are the in in first year and the most complicated of love theory, Skinner's theory, opera conditioner, psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> I I actually crammed some of those courses to pull through in first year. It, 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 it became a bit clearer even when I got to master's and PhD. Can you imagine? <laughs> so now I'm here as a psychologist and uh, I think it uh, paved way for me to understand quite a lot of things about life in general because one good thing about psychology is the more you go deeper, you're, you're, you're the guinea pig. Okay, you yourself, you're the guinea pig because everything is a course that every day you learn something about yourself as you are also understanding the course. That's the story of my life and my journey towards psychology. An interesting (laughs) one, a very interesting one. And I mean, psychology and you being a clinical psychologist, would you say that psychologists are valued in Nigerian society. I ask that because, I mean, for me, I think the past maybe four, five years is when I realized that the issues of mental health in particular um, have really come to the fore. And now people are beginning to 
be more aware, you know, psychologists were not appreciated then, or maybe people felt like, um, you know how we treat mental health in a part of the world. I mean, people would hardly even admit that they have an issue, it's either spiritual or some other means. Being a, a psychologist, uh, would you say you are appreciated, uh, particularly in an African context? Um, it's a tricky one because of the way we view mental health issues. Like I said, it's a, this, uh, my discipline has been able to help me to understand a lot of things. Because growing up, there are people, children with uh, mental retardation, autistic children, and so on. And, you know, then because of lack of, I can't say ignorance because it was lack of information. First of all, the mother is traumatized. They will accuse the mother that you were a witch, you did something horrible. That is why you get back to this kind of, we call it, we call it Obanje, they say Obanje children. That's why you get back to, so the mother sometimes is driven out from the family. Is always the mother, not the father. You know, so they always say, okay, this woman is a wicked woman. Probably she came from a bad family. And for goodness sake, this child is just suffering from a variant of mental retardation. Okay? Yeah. Then I look back, I was like, oh my God. So this is actually what is happening or what happened, you know? And you could see in a situation where nobody had information on what actually was the root cause and how to, you know, tackle the issue, the problem. So you see, I'm sure you must have, we must have experienced a lot of, you know, post-traumatic disorders from the, from the part of the parents and also the child. So it's, uh, there's a lot of mysteriousness surrounding mental illness, even up till, up till now. So it's quite a challenging, but I'm glad that through like the current realities, the current global world, you know, there's, there's a lot we le- that we have to learn from social media and uh, these issues are coming up. Unlike then, when, during, uh, when we are coming up, we didn't have social media to also guide us to see, okay, this is the cause of this, this is it's not the fault of the mother or the father. Like, for example, this nonsense of having a girl child and a male child. It was when we started biology that we were like, yeah, hello, it's not our fault. If you give me a Y chromosome, we we'll have a male child. <laughs> I can only produce XX. Okay? But then they say, ah, this woman, you can't have a male child. You are cursed. What rubbish. Yes, and... Uh, Coming to being valued as a psychologist, you have to understand and value yourself first. I'm proudly a psychologist, okay? I see things a lot different. Even when I'm under so much pressure and trauma, I look at the, I try to see the silver lining in in anything, any situation I'm in. I try to look at, okay, Everywhere is dark, but there is a, a ray of light somewhere. And I look towards that light because the world, it, it, it's not a bed of roses. Life itself is complicated. Okay? So you can, it, it can't always be all smiles. When it is smiles, grab it. You grab the sunshine. But when it is gloomy, you try to look at the resilience. Okay, let's look at the beauty. Let's see something we can learn from it. Even when we make mistakes, just learn from the mistakes, move it aside and move on, okay? So in Nigeria, yeah, Nigeria is a very spiritual, religious country. And most of the time, those cases of mental issues will go to your pastor, okay? And you know, the pastor, within the limit of his or her understanding, will tell you, ah, this child is your mother in the village. I don't also blame them because 
they are also don't understand the nitty gritties of that. That's why sometimes we encourage uh, pastors to have a bit of, you know, psychology 101 to be able to guide the flock properly so that they don't lead them into, because leading, uh, believing in something that is not realistic, you know? So that is just uh, that. So it will help you to have a broader view of so many things, you know? And uh, in my country, especially, we have a strong organization of which I'm part of, the Nigerian Psychological Association and also the Nigerian, uh, the Clinical Association in Nigeria. And we have been trying to push our bill, you know, it's taking some time for the for that bill to pass. And it's almost there. Some has been passed, you know, because we have some of our colleagues in the hospitals that have issues with placement. Sometimes they don't know what to refer to there to, to, to call them, whether they are directors or psych counselors or psychological assessment officers and all that. So we've been able to pass that. And I always always give kudos to social media because this generation have more information. So they can actually weigh the options and say, okay, this is not, you know, they have more information out there. So social media is really, really a very good uh, instrument for this generation. So I always, I see my children, the way they grow up with so much information and uh, I really marvel. Would you say that having uh, some kind of support is very, very needed in this day and age. And by support, I mean um, having certain people that you can always pick a phone and talk to. You can always like be vulnerable uh, around and you can just bear your, your heart. I say that because uh, on a personal level, I was dealing with some very difficult things in 2020 I mean, on second thought, I think I should have seen a psychologist then or a therapist, but um, it didn't even occur to me because I had just started a new job and the pressures of the job and also dealing with a, a particular medical condition. And I was just going crazy. It was such a dark, dark time in my life. And I had about four people, including my sister and my mother, that anytime I pick a phone and talk to them and just bear my heart, I leave the conversation uplifted. Yes. You know, um, it's good to tap into, like, you know, I use the phrase, our significant others, you know, because every problem, you, 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 you mustn't run to a psychologist, you know, if you have all, uh, you know, in, the, in the case of, uh, uh, you know, problems, some of the problems actually need somebody you trust and love to talk to, you know? Somebody that can give you that reality check. Like a girlfriend, they say, hey, my friend, what is it? You know, you have to, you know, you know, buckle up and suck it in, you know? That kind of person that can give you the push. So you have your, so you need to have kind of, that social support is very important, okay? And choose your friends wisely. Okay, the way I choose friends, I, I'm, I'm not a very social person and I have very few friends. And sometimes the way I choose my friends that may be different from the norm, but I choose my friends from the kind of interest I have. So you have to also check your personality to know the kind of people, the kind of friends you should go, you know, move with. Not any kind of person. It's some somebody that will add value to you. So that kind of person can always, you know, share. You can always share your worries, your anxieties, and then um, with that uh, uh, person. Okay. And like I said earlier, my my mom is my best friend. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. Anytime I talk to her, it is there's always a lot of wisdom because she has so much strength. In that. So what I'm trying to say is just look for that person, that second person that brings out the best in you, that second person that loves you unconditionally without 
condemning you, okay, it's very difficult to get those people, you know, that kind of friend. So that second person that is that will give you that emotional support and understand your vulner vulnerability. If you're blessed and you can afford a psychologist, fine. If that is, that is for the emotional problems that are not so severe, because the severe ones, you they are so obvious that you need a, a medical uh, assessment and their management. But there are ones that are, are everyday issues that could uh, potentially lead to a more catastrophic end. So when you notice that, you can lean on your friend and uh, and uh, seek for support. That's why most of the time we have you, when you see issues of drug abuse and everything, the background is always kind of faulty because something triggered that. And children bottle up a lot. As a parent, look at their, your children. Try to make them feel that they are the best thing that happened to you. You understand? I do that a lot intentionally. When I call my daughter, even at 21, I say, ah, sweetie, how are you? I, you know I love you. You say, mommy, stop that. <laughs> but it sets a message because it, all, it tells her that she's special. No matter the problem she finds herself, she knows that she has a lot of love. It's not as if I don't have any other things to do with my life, but it is intentional because you must build that emotional resilience. And with that, the sky is their limit because they need to be healthy. They need to be strong to be able to blossom. And I love that your mom gave this love to you and you're giving it back yeah. to your children and your children will give it back to their children. And that, you are just, is it. yes, you're just creating like a cycle and a generation to generation to generation of love. And this love is yeah. going to be unleashed into the world. I think it's... Yeah, because, because, because I noticed, because my mom, I could see that the love, what she did with us was intentional. You know, it's not, I don't know, I don't know how to put it, but I, how can you have 10 children and all of them feel so special? You know, there is no tension and she has time for all of us, you know? So it's uh, probably I grew up with that and I needed to pass it on to my children. And definitely, you know, these are the kind of uh, learning, you know, experiential learning. You know, you experienced it. It's not something you get from the classroom or something. And when you go back, when you get to another stage of your life, you look back. My son will look back and say, my mom gave me so much love. And he will love his wife because that love came from, it was a feminine love. And, you know, the, the feminine love is full of warmth. It's just, it's, it's, it's just beautiful. So and I'm sure he will love his wife and the children. Yeah, I I, I love it. I love it. I, I spoke to um Inkem. Inkem is a librarian in Nigeria. I spoke to her on the okay. podcast too, and then she also said that it is so important to love her children to the point that they know that when you go into the world and anything yeah. you touch fails just know that when you come back home like your mom is yeah, here yeah. to love you no matter what and yeah I, I think it's such a beautiful thing and maybe like you said yeah. it's a Nigerian thing because this is also coming from another Nigerian <laughs> in camp so yeah you know yeah. it's in us we have it in us we have the gene believe it or yeah we have we have the gene the happy gene so your introduction to open was as a result of wanting a job closer to you because you had children <laughs> then <laughs> and then you know, you found uh, a job at the university just five minutes away and yes. that's <laughs> yes that was how you got into the world of open T tell me tell me about that story how how did that unfold just like my my psychologic story when god wants to chat your path you will just be guided no matter where you think you want to go, you'll be guided. So when uh, I was about ready 
for the world of work because um, I was a student and a PhD student, so I decided to just uh, have focus on my children. I had my three children as a student, and uh, I really wasn't. I didn't actually work for the for eight years after my marriage because I was having children. I had to take care of them and uh, be sure that they are fine. And uh, it wasn't also very easy for me because I then, you know, I married my friend and uh, and uh, it, it, it wasn't, it, it, how do I put it? It, it? The finances wasn't there that much, okay? But we need, all, all, all I knew was that I wanted to, you know, further my education, went for my master's and PhD, Luckily, I was able to get some kind of uh, support from my university for my PhD, and I was teaching as a, an assistant lecturer. So my school fees were waived for me. And also because I also needed to, I couldn't work because I had to be there to take care of the children. I was also pregnant most of the time. Eight years down the line, I felt, okay, they are a bit strong enough to, to at least be in school and uh, while I do something extra. And uh, there was a, the then Opu University was just a few uh, minutes away from my, I actually moved from another part of Lagos to uh, the part of Lagos where Opu University was situated. So when I was moving, I saw the, the signpost, National Open, then Open University of Nigeria. I said, oh, okay, what is what is this all about? Open University, I've not heard of it because then it was very new. They were just less than a year in existence. Yes, and I actually, I came in 2006. I was the third batch of uh, staff employed. And uh, I also noticed that those those that came in before me couldn't really cope because there was a lot of misconception. So I said, hey, once it has university, because I I always tell my mom that I want to be a professor. When I made that uh, exclamation, I actually didn't know what it was. I just love the sound of professor. <laughs> I was just uh, less than eight nine years. Then, and I said, okay, you're a professor. Oh, okay. I said, my mom, I love the sound of professors. It's like I want to be a professor. So when I got to Open University, I just saw the university, what I saw was university. I didn't actually I emphasize the open. I said, okay, once there's university attached to it, we will see. Okay. So when I applied, then people didn't want to come to Open University because none of us had the training, okay? None of us. It was quite frustrating and challenging. And because the, the conventional, traditional mode universities, we are, they saw us as threat. They said, ah, how can you, how can technology? That's, what do you mean? That you're supposed to be the teacher. You start there, you talk, you're the authority and your, children, your students who, respect you, you are the best you are the best knowledge, everything is about you, that knowledge and everything. So why should you why what is what what is technology mediated learning? So and there was so it was so mysterious to everyone. But I applied and in the interview somehow I was so naive I they asked me what do you know about open? I said I don't know anything. I've tried to understand what you do here, but it's not clear. But the spirit is willing to learn, <laughs> you know. So, and some of the interview panel, they both start laughing. Some didn't find it funny. I said, yeah, I mean, I'm running up my postgraduate, my PhD in psychology. You don't even have psychology in the, in, in the institution, but... I think I can fit in the Faculty of Science and Technology, but I don't really know much about distance education. And I'm also so not good with technology. 
I can't type properly. I was typing with one finger. <laughs> but I think the vision, because I read their vision, and it resonates with what I believe in, providing access, equity, learning opportunities, and also lifelong learning, and reaching the unreached. And I was able to align to that vision because of my training, probably. Because in psychology, what is what we call humanistic psychology, is about bringing out the best in people. And how do you do that? By providing opportunities for that person to thrive. And that opportunity is what I saw in the vision of the school. And they gave me a job in 2006. <laughs> So that was how I came into Oku University and we were a set of, I think, 10 to that came in in 2006. Along the line, half of, half of my colleagues left because they couldn't understand it. They were the best, they, they were IT savvy. They are like, what are we doing here? We don't even understand this. It's complicated. How can I wake up in the morning and I don't stand in front of my students to teach? Because for you to thrive in open university system, you have to be self-assured. Yes, they don't see me, but they can hear me. And you can speak, you can make yourself to be heard by being innovative. So they felt, oh, then in a lot of newspaper articles about open university and everything. So they thought they got embarrassed. And also because they want to be known physically. They want to stand there as an authority. Yes, this is me and Professor so so and so. If I have come to a lecture room, it must be filled up. And you do know sometimes so they, it can be brutal. Because sometimes you like you give what you want to give and hold what you want to hold. Which is not right. It's about guiding them to find the information. You know? Yeah. And that is the beauty of all this uh, of uh, open educational resources and, and so on. So that is my journey towards open. I have no apologies for anybody and I have no regrets because I can remember uh, my organization, the Nigerian the Psychology Association. Sometimes when I go for the for the conference, they, they, they don't even call, refer to me by my name. They say the lady from Open University, you know, in a very cynical manner. Ah, open. Okay, open university talk. I'm like, hello, I'm part of you. Why treat me differently? You know, something and it made me I drew a bit bad because I I felt that I was kind of pushed away because of my decision to go towards open, open. education. But here came COVID-19. And the lady from Open University, <laughs> the announcer calling me, ah, okay, madam, Open University, what do we do? I said, oh, okay, hello, welcome to my life. Yes. <laughs> so that is that, I don't know whether I've been able to answer your question. You, you have, you have answered my question. Yeah. And it's, it's very interesting, you know, the point you make about the people who left. People like control. And it's because they can't just... I think they, those who left, they just can't imagine. Like, I need this control. I need to feel powerful. And this system means I have to relinquish that control yeah. and the way I want to exercise that control. So a lot of them will run. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can understand why uh, some of your colleagues will treat you the way they treat you. Yeah. I even loved it. For some of them, first of all, when I joined there, they, vote, they passed a vote informally that I was the person that, uh, uh, that would be least successful as a psychologist. You know, I was not given a chance. They, and I felt my teachers, although they didn't really come to, my, to say it to, to me, but they felt so disappointed. Even one mentioned that he wasted his time training Jane. I wow. he said that the training was a waste of time. And when I was going to the Open University, I needed reference. Ah, it was difficult. It beats my mind, this aversion to open. It's just about misconception. I don't blame anyone because I also started like that. I didn't know what open is. But I was courageous enough 
also pushed by my circumstances, my family circumstances. I was not given, I didn't have an option B. That option is stay very close to home, take care of these children, and go to anywhere that has university written on it. <laughs> so there was no option B. So, but somehow I had to tell, I had to make up my mind, okay, let me just embrace this. I saw the vision and see how best I can uh, contribute. So it's about misconception, it's about uh, being open-minded, okay? Because open is also being open-minded. It's, 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 it's such a mysterious uh, thing. And you know our perception here, anything that is open and free is free, free of charge, free, open. Cheap. The, that's, that's cheap. Uh -huh. You know, and they, they don't want that. And why not? The, 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 the only, the best thing in life is the air we breathe. And it's so open, it is cheap, it is free, it is there for everyone. And that is why we are surviving. So why do we have to, and God, in all his wisdom, gave us that. Okay? So why are we so myopic and narrow-minded? So we just be open-minded, learn something new. If there's a new emerging issue that you need to learn, even if you don't believe in that, just be a bit flexible. Don't uh, uh, castigate others for trying to embrace that. Just be a bit flexible and try to accommodate that, even if you don't believe in that. Yeah. yeah. And you, you describe yourself as a therapist using open to heal everything around you. What does that mean? I was a, the dean of a faculty of health science at some point in the institution, 2016, 2018. And uh, I had to manage uh, nurses. It was one of the highlights of my career. Then the Nigerian government um, made the declaration that, you know, the training, nursing training, usually we start from diploma, you know, certificate, you know, and all that. So the nurses are very resilient people. They spend so many years reading one small, 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 just at the top. And at the end of the day, they don't have their degree. They have a certificate in midwifery diploma in these uh, midwifery nursing, uh, general nursing, and so on. So the government said, if you don't have a BSc nursing, you will not progress. There was panic everywhere. The nurses couldn't have left their job to go to the mainstream university. Yeah. So open university was the only option. You know, that experience is so, it's, it's a beautiful one. Open university was the only option. So they were able to still, still hold on to their job and enroll in the BSc, in our BSc program. Then at some point we have, we had up to, they were the largest population in my in my faculty. They were up to 30,000 then. It was that huge. And to them, it is a big project. They had to survive. They had to get this very elusive BSc. Some even had to go outside the country or the distance learning program and everything. But Open University was affordable for them. And it, Every convocation that I have to announce my students, the nurses are usually more up to 80% in the congregation. And you could see the shout. Anytime I announce, I hereby present my students for BNSC Nursing Science, it gives me goosebumps because you see the, the joy. The joy from 64-year-old nurse that is about to retire and was never promoted because she didn't have a BSc, okay? And with that BSc, once it is tendered in the organization, she gets promoted as a director and retires as a director with all the benefit. And now that program is our flagship program. We have trained more than 30, 40,000 nurses in Nigeria. Wow. And we gave them that opportunity to work and study. 
and that is the therapy of open university. No other, the, I'm sorry, but the conventional university will not give you that flexibility, you know? And also for those that, those, uh, those women in the 60, 70 age range that were able to get that BSc and retire with dignity because their dignity was taken from them. Yeah. So that was a high point for me. It was really, I always feel proud of myself that I uplifted, even if they are not aware of that, but it's a pact. It's, it's kind of a promise I made to myself that, God, if you give me this opportunity, I can let me redeem these nurses so that they will stop crying. And I'm sure they are no longer crying. And recently, before I came to call, I was a director at one of our study centers in, in Abuja, Wuse Study Center. It was, I always look at it from moving from theory to practical because that was when I was like flooded with the real reality of open education. The beauty of open education, it was so beautiful that, and also, I also, I also need to know that, you know, you do the kind of job that end every morning you wake up, you smile, and you're happy to go to work. That is how I feel working in open university. I don't know about others. I'm always happy going to work and everything about open. So when I got to the there as a center director, I had to up to 9,000 student population. They could feel that happiness, you know, from me that because, because they weren't so sure. They had challenges and so on technology-wise and some of the teaching problems and so on. But anytime I talk to them, we have student week, I look at them and I try to explain that this is what you need to do and you have to be open-minded. Your challenges are these, but look at the beauty of this. You have the opportunity to go to school and go to work, even at your age. I had 89, I think my oldest student then was 89 years, one a lady. You know, I said, Mama is here, she's still wow. studying, and you're here, you're complaining. Uh, I will tell the other that you, you're not so sure. I, look, I try to share the beauty of open education. I also learned from my visually impaired students. I had three of them or four, yeah. And I didn't know how to reach to them. I had to open up to them and say, okay, how do I serve you better? They told me that they need this software, they need this, they need special concession. If they want to come to exam, can they be allowed to come with their lap, no, laptops because they have their software that will read the questions for them? I had to write to the management to take special permission for that because I want to accommodate everyone. And what, what an area I found so intriguing and interesting is in my country, we have this Puda, the, the women in Puda. I realized I found it so beautiful working with them because there are so many of them in my, in, my, in my center, study center. And what I found really interesting was that even the fact that they were given opportunity to, to enroll in open university in, uh, to, to, uh, to earn a degree because the, that the PUDA uh, the experience, you know, you're not as, actually allowed to interface with the outside world in per se. They are not supposed to see your face, I hope I'm right. But Open University gave them that opportunity. So they were actually studying in their rooms. Yeah. And they were getting any degrees from without coming out at all. Okay. And then in my institution, for exams, that is where you are expected to actually come out to take your exam. So that is the only time we see, we we'll try to see, so that you will know that you are not a good student. And fortunately, those women are also expected to come out. Okay? So at any time they come out and I see the hall is filled with that, I'm like, yes, this is it. Because we train a woman, you train the nation. Yes. That lady in Puda is able to get her BSc in anything. And she's the one to, that is closest to her children. She has to impact something. And if you don't have a, an, an, a, an inquisitive and educated mind, you will not be able to impact properly. 
So I find that that's what I, when I got there, I had to interface with the visually impaired. I had to interface with those with mental challenges. I know exactly how to handle, how to do a that. I had to interface with women in Puda. And also I had to interface with nursing mothers. I had, I allowed them to come in uh, part of our policies, you at your discretion to allow them to come with their babies. So I have a lot of women, their children will be breastfeeding on their lap and they are writing exams. So there is a special seat for them at the one side of the hall because sometimes the child cries out. And before exam, I explained to my student that yes, we need to accommodate each other. We have the nursing mother as this side of the uh, exam. Their children may cry, but just in the spirit of this, you know, if, if, it's, if it's Nigeria, we'll say, now we, we. Is that, you know, we have to take care of each other. You yeah. Know? So, so instead of my student complaining, hi, the, ch the children are crying. So, so, so when they cry, we quickly give the mother the opportunity to go to a next room. There's a, there's actually a baby room next there where they can finish the breastfeeding and quickly come back. And it is open, you know, it's only an open system that can give you that opportunity. So you, I, don't, I don't know whether you understand. It is, it is so beautiful. Completely it is, beautiful. It is so uplifting. It is what humanity should, should you know, learn to appreciate. You may not understand it, but give it a chance. You know, and if I die tomorrow, I will say, my God, ah, yes, I think I did what you sent me. You dropped me in the word for something. Exactly. I didn't know what it died, but you, you just used your one leg and you were just pushing me there. Okay, move. Like we say in humanity psychology, you have to find the meaning of your life. Mm -hmm. It's a part of therapy that we use for, for our clients. What is the meaning of your life? I think I found it. <laughs> and yeah. and it's beautiful. And as you tell these stories, it's just, and I, I'll go back to your foundation. Your foundation is love. And love is very inclusive. Love is open. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. And for me, I think that is where it's, it's rooted. That is where the roots come from. And it's beautiful how you are just changing lives, making dreams happen for other people with you know, what it, you and, do. And without, we, we, and without much effort, because it's just something that, that gives you joy, you know? This has been a very interesting conversation for me. It's been very enlightening. I've learned a lot. And I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your time. You are such a happy person that is very infectious. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very infectious. So I'm just being here laughing no, and no, giggling. No, people, people that take me serious, I say, when I laugh, I say, can, can you be serious for once in your life? I say, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm, I'm still laughing. <laughs> because because yeah, it's a blessing, really. Your joy is so infectious, Prof. And I love that I got to experience it. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Professor Jane Francis Obiageli Abu, a clinical psychologist and an open educational resource advocate. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund for Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Wikiloves Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy, and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu, and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open. <laughs>